Hello, everyone. My name is Mitch. I'll be your moderator today. We have Naomi in the control room, who will be our pilot. And we have Jose, who will be your host and raunchy constellation storyteller. That's another thing we should mention, is that this is a program for adults. A lot of constellations involve the Green gods and the things they got up to. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I, I also have a, I have another screen up here. So if I go like this, it's not because I'm getting a message through the ether. It's because I have my notes right here and I got to see what's going on. So forgive me if that happens. Is and yes, sorry if there was any confusion when we first got started. If you first tuned in and we were in the middle of a conversation, it's our tradition in these programs to nerd out. But we're going to get started with the official program. So if you came in the middle of that conversation, don't worry, you didn't miss, you didn't miss anything. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm going to be hosting. Naomi's our pilot today. Naomi, you're a great pilot. I just gotta say. Thank you. I appreciate that. It means a lot from you, Jose. Um, there's another tradition we have here, which is a joke that um, I always tell. Oh, no. before we get started. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, <clears throat> two carbon atoms are hanging out. One carbon atom turns to the other carbon atom and goes, oh, I think I lost an electron. Second one says, are you sure? First one says, yes, I'm positive. <laughs> Oh, so good. It's, All right. <laughs> without the dance you normally do in the planetarium, Jose, there's, <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> All right. So this is how the program this evening is going to go. We are going to start with what the night sky looks like from Denver. I know not everybody tuning in is from the Denver metro area, um, but this is what the sky looks like from Denver this evening. And uh, we are going to show you some constellations that you will be able to see if you go out stargazing tonight. You might want to stay up. This is uh, image you see on your screen is actually what the night sky here in Denver will look like at midnight. We're going to tell some fun constellation stories and have uh, some fun uh, learning the backgrounds of why uh, some of those uh, scorpions and crabs and giraffes and other various creatures got up into the sky. And then in the second half of the program, we'll be able to fly around the universe and take a close look at planets and moons. And that's where, if you have questions or things you wanna see, you can suggest you can suggest those to us in the chat. Matt, Mitch is gonna be keeping an eye on that, right, Mitch? You got it. All right, so let's get started with the stories. We're gonna start with the constellation Delphinius, the dolphin constellation, there it is right there. You can see, that whatever medieval monk drew the images we pulled for this had never been anywhere near the ocean or seen a dolphin <laughs> because that is not at all what a dolphin looks like. <laughs> but, but the story of Delphinius is that Poseidon, who is the god of the sea, fell in love uh, with a nymph. There's Poseidon right there. You can tell because he's got his trident. It's symbolism. I learned that in art history class. Trident and, uh, <laughs> well, depends on which era you're talking about. That's true, that's true. Uh, and a billowy cloth. There always tends to be a billowy cloth in these statues and paintings. Well, I'll point him out when we see it. Yeah, he is ripped for sure. Yeah, come on. Anyway, <clears throat> so Poseidon fell in love uh, with a nymph, I'm probably gonna butcher this name, Amphorite, Amphorite. There she is, and there's the billowy cloth and lots of babies for some reason. They just happen to hang out, I think. There's a lot of flying babies in ancient Greece. Anyway, so um, Amphorite was one of the Nereids who, s they sort of symbolized things that were beautiful uh, about the sea, um, kind about the sea. And so she resisted his advances and wanting to protect her virginity, she fled to the Atlas Mountains. And so Poseidon sent several searchers out to find her, including his dolphin pal, Delphinius. And uh, there's a, that's a real photo of Delphinius right there. That's actual totally. Historically accurate. Historically Taken accurate. Right temple. Yeah. Photo specifically. Yeah, I think this is dated to circa 300 BC uh, E. But um, so Delphinius found Amphorite and soothed her and brought her back to Poseidon, you know, kind of, oh, I know you have cold feet, but dude is ripped. So, and he's a god and not just of the sea, but also of earthquakes. So if you ever want to have an earthquake, you know, talked her into it basically. And then Amphorite and Poseidon were married. Poseidon was so happy with, with Delphinius that he placed him, yeah, there's a wedding photo right there. 
more billowy cloth, and another baby. See, I told you, they're just all over the place. They're just like on the ground, in the sky. And uh, so Delphinius got put into the sky, and we can see him in the sky this evening. Um, there's a lot of depictions of Poseidon where they place a dolphin near him, and that's usually Delphinius. So that's, he's like usually got a dolphin at his feet and things like that. Also, I just want to point out with this constellation, if you can find it, I'm going to take off the image of it. Um, it is honestly, once you find a couple other constellations we point out tonight, it's not that hard. It's like a weird little triangle with a line. But man, you look like the coolest astronomer out there. It is a great camping party trick to find this constellation. People are like, whoa, you really know the sky. So pro tip, uh, social distance with camping and uh, impress people. I see a question here. Do, uh, what are the directions on the map, Naomi? Where so this is a view like we would have in the planetarium. So imagine this is a dome. North is down, south is up, east is to the right, and west is to the left. All Which right. My camera might be flipped, so pointing directions was not helpful to you. Sorry. <laughs> Listen to what I say, not what I do. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to our next constellation story. This is about a very famous constellation called Cygnus, the swan. There are several different stories associated with swans. We went with this one because it's one of the more famous ones. Also, this person, I don't think had ever seen a swan fly before. What is it doing with its legs? Uh, this monk must have been like stuck inside a monastery forever. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the story of Cygna involves Zeus and anything that involves Zeus, of course, involves a lot of terrible shenanigans. So Zeus was looking down from Mount Olympus one day and saw Leda. Uh, there's Zeus right there. Also has a really good gym uh, program. Really stays ripped there. And that's his lightning bolt. That's not a bunch of sticks. That's what I thought it was when we first found this. Thing. Anyway, so Zeus was looking down from uh, Mount Olympus one day and he saw Leda. Leda was the daughter of the king of Peron, which I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly. And when uh, Leda came of age, she was married to the to King uh, Tyrandarius of Sparta. So Tyrandarius had been placed on the throne by Hercules. So, you know, he's got friends in high places. Leda was very beautiful, and her beauty, of course, attracted the attention of Zeus. Any Anyone or anything beautiful, you know, Zeus is going to show up eventually. So he spied Leda, and she was so roused to action, which is <laughs> the <laughs> version we got for of this, uh, that he transformed himself into a magnificent swan. Then portraying himself as a bird escaping from an eagle, Zeus lay down next to Leda and impregnated her. <laughs> it's more billowy cloths and lots of people around again. Not a lot of privacy in ancient Greece. I mean, these are grown-ups too. So, uh, yeah, see somebody says, yikes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Welcome to the world of Zeus, yes. Yes. Now, Leda also um, uh, slept with her husband on this exact same day. So this led to a bit of a complication. Later, about nine months later, Leda would give birth to two eggs. <laughs> uh, and out of these two eggs were four uh, children, two sets of twins. These children were Castor and Pollux, who are heroes. They're also the two brightest stars in Gemini. I love the look on her face in this painting because she's like, I just gave birth to two eggs and four kids. Like, she's like, do you see what I'm dealing with right here? Do you see this? And uh, <laughs> so Castor and Pollux uh, are two famous twins. One of them was immortal and one of them was not. And so when one of them died, Zeus put both of them into the sky. That's the constellation Gemini. And um, the other two children she had were Helen and Clytemnestra. Of course, Helen is famous for uh, being abducted and that begins the Trojan War. And then Clytemnestra, Agamemnon's wife, killed, killed Agamemnon when he got back from Troy and this tragedy, 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 tragedy. So not only did she give birth to two eggs and four kids, but all of her kids had a pretty rough time. Poor Leda. And that tends to be what happens when Zeus gets involved. Lots of shenanigans and broken hearts. The last constellation we're going to tell is uh, the story of the eagle constellation, Aquila. And so this constellation uh, is associated with Zeus. Zeus would often be said to turn into eagles. That was a symbol of his. 
And one day when he was flying around as an eagle, he looked down and he saw the most beautiful boy that he had ever seen, Ganymede. And uh, yeah, Helen was the daughter of a god and a zoo, uh, and a goose. Yeah, she was a swan, swan baby. Uh, so Ganymede was about 12 years old and he was so incredibly beautiful that Zeus needed to have him for himself. And so he, he, Ganymede has even been described as, by Homer as like the most beautiful of all mortals. So while he was out watching his father's sheep one day, Zeus just swooped down and snatched him up and carried him off to Mount Olympus. <laughs> get the intense look in that eagle's face. <laughs> And uh, so Ganymede got abducted and taken to Mount Olympus, where Zeus made him the uh, cupbearer to the gods. This made Hera very, very mad because it was her own daughter, the goddess of youth, that had held that role before. And uh, yeah, Ganymede and Zeus went on all sorts of adventures. Look at the carving there on those words, so well carved. I mean, the chisel work is just impressive. I only find the finest statues to depict here in, at, at our virtual tour. <laughs> yes. Yes, perfect. So Kila, uh, the eagle, and Ganymede would fly all over the world. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, Zeus was always impressed by how selfless Ganymede was and how generous he was. And so one, uh, one time there was a drought upon the land and everyone needed rain. And since uh, Ganymede was the cup bearer, the water bearer to the gods, he asked for permission to bring water to people and became the god of rain, Aquarius, which also has its own constellation. Um, so if you're an Aquarian, your uh, constellation is an, an, an abducted 12-year-old with Stockholm Syndrome. So I don't know if that explains anything about your sign, but uh, yeah. Those are our constellation stories right there. I see a question in the chat says, why are all these constellations uh, Greek and uh, Roman names? And that's because during a, a couple hundred years ago in the 1700s, when astronomy was really kind of being codified, um, they were like, uh, uh, man, the Romans are just the best. You know, in Europe, they were like, man, the Romans were the best and the Greeks were the best. So we're gonna have everything have a Greek or Roman name and we're just gonna decide it for the whole world. Nobody else gets to say. And yeah, when, when Jose says they, he means a bunch of white people in Europe. <laughs> yes. What well, we were yes. going to call everything. They're like, yeah. <laughs> and so here we are. So all over the uh, world, there are different names and different stories for a lot of constellations. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for this program, we specifically told the Greco-Roman myths because many of the other stories about the sky come from s cultures that are still thriving and living cultures. And uh, we don't want to tell stories that are not ours to tell. So we told the Greco-Roman stories um, I, if I get struck by lightning, then I'll be sorry, Zeus, tomorrow. Um, but uh, I think we're okay. There's another, sh uh, there is a planet that is visible in the night sky right now as well. And that is Jupiter. Speaking of all these shenanigans that Jupiter slash Zeus is getting into. Uh, so uh, if you're a 12 year old boy or a woman, you might want to stay inside and keep an eye out for swans. Because uh, Jupiter is up and about tonight but we're actually gonna fly in and take a close look at Jupiter now. This is when we're gonna transition away from our constellation stories and take a close look at some things in our universe. And full disclaimer, uh, you're gonna see the screen change here of view. We're gonna go to a flatter view to be able to see these cool objects outside of our, our normal night sky view that we'd see in the planetarium. So here we go, I get to warp space and time in three, two, one. There we go. Yeah. It's sadly not as cool as Warp Drive. I added sound effects. I appreciated that. That was a nice touch this time. I, I, I appreciate your backup. Okay, so in this part of the program, we're going to start here at Jupiter. And what Naomi, Mitch, and I will do is we'll give you some information about what you're seeing, some, uh, some facts about Jupiter. We might pepper in a few jokes because this is all about having fun. And uh, then we'll open it up to the chat. So if you have questions about what we're seeing or other places you want to explore in the universe, you can type those into the chat. Mitch will keep an eye on that for you. Um, we have some limitations through the program that we're using. So if you want to go to your favorite star, you know, HH34, we can do that one, but we don't have HH36. 
uh, and stars like that. <laughs> so we may not be get to we may not be able to get to to each location. Now here we are, Jupiter. As we zoomed in, you saw a bunch of lines, and those lines actually represent Jupiter's moons. Jupiter has a lot of moons, but most of those moons are not big enough to be around like a ball, like our moon. Most of them are like they look like gigantic flying potatoes. Uh, they're probably asteroids that got too close to Jupiter, and Jupiter has a lot of gravity, so it captured those asteroids and kept them as moons. Zeus, capturing, capturing women, capturing asteroids, man, never gives up. Jupiter does have some very large moons, though, including the largest moon in the solar system, which is named Ganymede. Oh, and we learned about Ganymede, abducted 12-year-old boy, Ganymede. The other large moons are Io, Europa, and Callisto, who are also unfortunate women who had incidents with, uh, with Jupiter. So, so I have a, we have a question in the chat. How old is Jupiter's red spot? Oh, that is a great question. And the answer is we don't know. You can see it up there on the top uh, of your screen as it comes around. And we've been able to see the red spot since we've had powerful enough telescopes. So that's about 300 years. Uh, my guess is it didn't start the day before we looked for it. It's probably older than that. But the red spot has been shrinking since we've as observed it. When we first observe, observed it about three centuries ago, the red spot was so big that you could fit three planet Earths inside of it. Um, now the red spot is about the size of one planet Earth. So it's definitely shrunk down. And as we continue to study it, some people think it may disappear. Some people may think it will get bigger. We don't really know a lot about what's going on underneath the surface of Jupiter's clouds. We're actually studying Jupiter right now with a spacecraft called the Juno spacecraft, which is Juno Hera. So his wife just showed up. And uh, she, uh, that spacecraft has the ability to peer through the clouds. And it's teaching us a lot about what's going on underneath the upper layers of Jupiter. Uh, we have another question, which is, how can people find Jupiter in the sky tonight? Naomi, I'll let you take that one. Um, so finding it in the sky, uh, if you don't already know, there's a great free resource called skymaps.com that releases a sky map every month. So if you're wanting to keep up with what planets are there, there's also great apps for your phone. Um, but really what you want to do is look to the east. That was showing at about midnight. It's pretty low on the horizon, but it'll keep coming on up. So look to the east about midnight for those night owls after party. Yeah. Yeah, if you're staying up late, look out for Jupiter. You'll be able to distinguish Jupiter from other stars because planets do not twinkle. Stars twinkle, planets do not. They just look like a blazing point of light. And if it's blinking green and red, it's an airplane. So watch out for those too. And Jose, people want to know what's up with all those different colors on Jupiter? Yeah, so Jupiter has, uh, it's a very stormy place. It spins really fast. It has the shortest day of any planet in the solar system. It turns around in about nine and a half hours. Um, and so it has a very strong Coriolis effect. A Coriolis effect is what causes the trade winds here on Earth to blow. It's why here in Colorado, our weather usually travels from west to east because of that Coriolis effect. And it's the same on Jupiter, that Coriolis effect causes these bands of clouds to form. We call them bands and zones. The different colors show uh, different elevations of cloud tops. So the lighter colors are about 30,000 feet, like a Mount Everest height, um, higher than the brownish red um, cloud tops. So if you were flying in an airplane 30,000 feet above the brown, uh, zones, you would not be able to see the tops of the other cloud tops next to you. So it's pretty wild extremes in the clouds there. And that uh, Coriolis effect makes those stripes, that stripey variation. And Jose, people want to know. Some people have apparently heard that Jupiter maybe had a chance to be a star. What would have to change about Jupiter for it to be a star? Oh, that's a great question. So Jupiter, um, being a gas giant, is made mostly of hydrogen and helium, and that's what stars are made out of. But stars have to have enough gravity and uh, pressure in their cores to fuse hydrogen into helium to create a thermonuclear reaction. Uh, you need a certain amount of gravity to do this. Now, if Jupiter was made out of more stuff, it, if it was able to gather about 11 times more mass, now, when we're talking about Jupiter, it's twice as massive as all the other planets combined. So 11 times more mass is a lot, it's a lot of mass. 
And then it would become a star, but it actually would become a very cool star. It wouldn't be a star like our sun. It would be what we call a brown dwarf star. And the surface of brown dwarf stars are about, you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Like they don't fuse material very quickly or very hot, hotly. So they don't, uh, I don't know, hotly is probably not, I don't know, is that a word? Anyway, they, <laughs> they don't fuse well. And so uh, Jupiter, if it, even if it did become a star, would not be very bright and hot like our sun. So it could, it could, if you find 11 times more Jupiters out there. Somehow. If you want I just have to jump in with one of my favorite NASA press conference stories. Um, that we found a, a system with a very, like a star, like 11 times Jupiter would become um, with a bunch of planets around it. And uh, which makes it an ultra cool dwarf star. And these NASA scientists not realizing how funny it was, was like, well, the thing is, when you have an ultra cool dwarf star, the planets hang around a lot closer to it. <laughs> the planets to an ultra cool star. I love that. Sounds great for a NASA press conference. But if you wanted to right. start one, you'd need like a hundred times more mass than Jupiter has. So, out of the question of having a binary star system like Tatooine, unfortunately. Yeah, I see somebody but, referencing 2001: A Space Odyssey. And that obelisk turns Jupiter into a star and suddenly there's living things on Europa. My God, it's full of stars. <laughs> uh, barring some incredible alien intervention, I think that Jupiter will remain as it is. And uh, now is a wonderful time for you to go to the chat and to type in some other place in the universe you wanna see. Do you have a favorite moon? Do you have a favorite planet? Any other questions you have? Where would people like to go? What would they like to see? Well, I see a question here that says, how close are the stars in globular clusters? So globular clusters are groupings of stars that contain millions or even billions of stars. And globular clusters, actually we are in a globular cluster. The Milky Way is just made up of a series of globular clusters. Um, if you were in a certain part of the globular cluster and you were very close to nearby stars, you probably have maybe some more stars in your night sky, but stars tend to be um, <clears throat> so far away from each other that uh, you'd have to get into like the globular cluster at the center of the Milky Way, the, the Milky Way bulge there, to really notice a big change in the number of stars. I see lots of options here. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of great suggestions. I'm seeing a lot of Requests for Pluto. Yeah. Ooh, one of Denver's biggest Pluto nerds on our panel here. Yeah. Which is Naomi. Um, <laughs> a lot of great suggestions. I will try to get to as many as we can. People are very concerned about Beetlejuice and whether oh. it can go supernova and destroy us. So maybe we should talk about that as well. It's not. It got better. I'm really disappointed. I feel like <laughs> a bad child that I was like, you know what can make 2020 better? A supernova. Listen. That would something to watch but no <laughs> listen i pretty listen i don't play roulette and i don't bank on stars exploding all right the odds are just not in your favor when you do those things uh <laughs> unfortunately it's reverse course so not gonna blow up now maybe in the next million or so years i see lots of great questions i saw one here says can we go to proxima centauri um that's one of those things that we can't really pull up an image for so all of the images we pull up here in this program are either real photos, like this is a real photo of Pluto taken by the New Horizons spacecraft, or they're computer generated images based on uh, scientific observation. So we have not programmed a surface of Proxima Centauri uh, into, the, into the program, so we can't fly off to places like that. But it would be cool to go to Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to our sun, about four four and a half light years away from us. All right, someone just made my day in the chat, said, can you talk about New Horizons, AKA the best spacecraft? Because it is, and you rock. And if you were here earlier, you heard about the story about how I had to dress up as the New Horizons spacecraft for a skit at the museum. So I feel you. Um, but I'm gonna jump in, Jose, is that okay with you? Go for it. All right, so these are images from New Horizons. This was the fastest spacecraft we've ever launched. It took nine years for it to get to Pluto, which is record-breaking considering it took Voyager 12 years to get to Neptune. 
And we thought Pluto was just going to be kind of like the moon, dead, cratered. It's only the size of Australia. How interesting can it really be? And we got there and it was so cool. So much cooler than we thought. Um, <laughs> we can see the heart of Pluto there right in front of us or part of Sputnik Planum and Tombaugh Regio. But there are glaciers of nitrogen. So think about air. It's so cold on Pluto that air freezes. Most of what you're breathing in right now is nitrogen. And so we see glaciers of that. We see volcanic mountains of water ice. We have this cool, crazy uh, hydrocarbon tar-like substance raining on the planet. And it's caused us to develop tons of new science to figure out why this teeny tiny little underdog of our solar system should still be this active because it should be dead and cratered, but we see smooth surfaces and we know it's still changing. And that is awesome. Also, if you look at the heart the right way, like I have it now, I think you can see kind of a head and then a nose to your right. And I think I see Pluto the dog. So <laughs> best place to go. Thank you, all you who wanted to go to Pluto. By the way, and Pluto, the the dwarf dwarf I talked about. What, go ahead, Mitch. I was just going to say, Pluto the dwarf planet and Pluto the dog were actually named in the same year, but neither one is named after the other one, as far as we can tell. That's true. Then yeah, Pluto. Someone, someone asked if Pluto's largest moon, which you can see there, is pronounced Charon or Charon. So it's actually Charon. It is tied to Greco-Roman myth, as most things are in our solar system. But the gentleman who named it actually had a wife named Sharon and wanted to make it more of a tribute to her. So they call it Charon to sound like Sharon, but also still being named Charon after the Greek and Roman myth. Welcome to Confusing Astronomy 101. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the agenda behind naming, because that's also true for Pluto. Um, Pluto was discovered at, in Arizona at the Percival Lowell Observatory. And Percival Lowell, before he died, was obsessed with finding another planet past Neptune. And uh, his, his, per, his will was for the, astronomy, uh, for the astronomers at, at uh, the Lowell Observatory to continue looking, and that's specifically why Pluto was found. Um, and so uh, when they went to name it, the name Pluto was suggested by an 11-year-old girl from Oxford, England, but it also had the handy distinction of being abbreviated PL, they named it Pluto, and it was found at the Percival Lowell Observatory. So they probably uh, leaned on that name uh, a, a bit, I feel like. A lot, of, and, and of course, if we're at Pluto, we have to talk about, you know, it, do we call Pluto a planet? Why do we not call Pluto a planet? That's because back in my day, there were nine planets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's not so much that. Uh, Pluto's the same. Pluto is the same as it has been for billions of years. And, you know, it is active. I shouldn't say it's static. It is changing in things, but it is relatively the same. And uh, what we have learned now is not more, we have learned more about Pluto, but mostly what we've learned more about is the region near Pluto, which we call the Kuiper Belt. And this is sort of like a second asteroid belt in our solar system. But instead of being filled with rocky things like the asteroid belt, it's filled with icy objects because it's so far away from the sun. And when I say icy, I mean astronomer icy, not what most people think of as icy. Because when most people think icy, they think like something you slurp out of a straw or you put into a drink to make it cold. And uh, to an astronomer, an ice is anything that can be a solid once it gets a certain distance away from the sun. So oxygen is an ice, Nitrogen is an ice, methane is an ice, carbon dioxide is an ice to an astronomer. So when I say icy objects, uh, I mean things that are made out of water ice, but also carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen, so on and so forth, oxygen. And that's also what Pluto is made out of. So Pluto is an icy body. And as we have found more and more uh, objects in the Kuiper belt, we've also found more and more Pluto-like objects. And that's really when calling Pluto a planet started to become not necessarily a problem, but potentially confusing. Because if we find objects that are almost identical to Pluto in the Kuiper belts, but are not similar at all to Mercury or Venus, Jupiter or Earth, 
Um, do we have thousands of planets in our solar system where hundreds of them are very similar and eight of them are very different than the others? Or do we come up with a new category? And so that's what ended up happening with Pluto. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's- It really is, Jose. What? It is the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus's fault. <laughs> Those were the unofficial two names of these two big Kuiper Belt objects that Mike Brown discovered that started part of this debate. They are now named Haumea and Makemake, but I still blame the Easter Bunny for Pluto's demise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, I think it's time to head off to our next object. Um, we have some deeper space suggestions, but let's stop by another planet first. A lot of people want to go to Mars. Everybody loves Mars. Want to get a little warmer apparently go back in in the solar system yeah well we'll get to like negative 200 degrees below zero fahrenheit that's definitely warmer than where we were hey it's twice the plant the temperature of pluto so i think this is toasty <laughs> that's right and yes matt damon does love mars he lived there for a long time in that it's movie where most of the budget for rescuing matt damon went was to get him off of mars it is a yeah. large budget that someone has calculated of how much we've spent rescuing Matt Damon via all the movies and The Martian was most of it. <laughs> very, very expensive. I will say the book, The Martian, that the movie is based on, is one of the best pieces of hard science fiction that you can read. It was written by a, a NASA employee. It has got a lot of really good actual science about what it might be like to try and live and survive on Mars. And the author admits that there are some things he had to take liberties with that would never happen. For example, the fact that a storm could blow a satellite dish over and impact an astronaut on Mars. The atmosphere is just way too thin for that to happen. And he has a great foreword in his book about when he decided to tweak science for plot reasons. Um, it, but it's a really great book. The movie's a lot of fun, but if you really love uh, science, uh, hard science fiction, definitely check out that book, The Martian. Um, Jose, people need to know, poop potatoes? Not a good idea. No. Can I take? Can I tell a funny story about this? <laughs> sure. So, what funny story do you have about poop potatoes? <laughs> so I was on my first date with my now boyfriend, who met me through the museum, and we were having a discussion about something. And somehow, the fact that there are a lot of perchlorates on the regolith of Mars, which is why you shouldn't eat poop potatoes beyond the poop part, is perchlorates will shut down your thyroid. I went on like a five minute nerdy rant about perchlorates and the research I had done on them and why you shouldn't eat potatoes. And I was like, oh, I messed this up. I messed this up good. Uh, but that is what he said, wooed him, was my nerdy rant about <laughs> perchlorates and poop potatoes. So you two all have hope in this world. <laughs> it's gonna be fine. Also, you I shouldn't also, eat poop oh. potatoes because of E. coli. Do not fertilize anything with human feces. That's just not a good idea. So. Um, there are also a couple things in the book that were scientifically accurate at the time for everything we knew. And since the book has been published, Curiosity gathered a lot of data. And the big one is we now know that there's a lot of ice underneath the surface of Mars. And so all the trouble he went through to create water would have been a lot easier because there's good as dug a little bit, found a bunch of ice. Um, on the, your screen, you can see two of the famous features on Mars. You can see sort of in that upper right corner, uh, Valles Marineris, or the Mariner Valley. That's actually the largest canyon we've ever discovered. It is about five times deeper than the Grand Canyon, about five miles uh, deep. And it, stretch, would, it would stretch from New York to California if you put it in the United States. It would, it's a really, really large canyon. It goes a quarter of the way around Mars. Like that big uh, aperture there in the middle, you could fit the entire state of Nebraska in there. It is a very, very large and very deep canyon. Um, but th th there's not evidence that this canyon was created by erosion like the Grand Canyon. This canyon, they think, was formed by volcanic processes. As the ground lifted up, it separated and uh, formed that uh, canyon. And actually, there is a very, in terms of elevation, high point on Mars just to the left of the canyon, which you can see the three Tharsis Montes uh, right there, which are huge volcanoes. And as we keep rotating around, we will be able to see Olympus Mons, which is that, well, you can just see it coming up here on the left. 
That's the largest mountain we've ever discovered. It would cover the state of Arizona and is about three times taller than Mount Everest. It would be really easy to uh, climb though, because the incline is so gradual. You could just, you know, you wouldn't even realize you were going uphill. Just like if you drive from Kansas to Denver, you don't realize you're going up a mile. Um, it would be really easy to climb this mountain, but you would need a spacesuit, not just because of Mars, but also because the top of the mountain actually pokes out above Mars's atmosphere. So it is out in the space. Doesn't erupt anymore. None of the volcanoes on Mars erupt anymore. And it wouldn't be possible for a, a mountain like this to form on the Earth. And that is because the Earth has too much gravity. The more gravity you have, you, you can only make smaller mountains. So since Mars has less mass, less gravity than the Earth, it can make these big, huge mountains like Olympus Mars. Mars, everybody loves Mars. How long is a day on Mars? About as long as a day on Earth, 24 and a half hours, so just a little bit longer. And people do root for finding life on Mars. Um, it's covered in organic chemicals. It had a lot of water on it a long time ago. It seems like a lot of the uh, ingredients for life are there. We don't know if there is liquid water under the surface. Um, because the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, that the boiling point of water is also its freezing temperature. Water on Mars sublimates. It goes right from ice right into water vapor, just like dry ice does here on the Earth, which is, of course, frozen carbon dioxide. And so uh, there's uh, no like pools or anything form in the summer or anything like that. Um, and then I see a question here. Are there magnetic poles on Mars? No, Mars does not have a, a magnetic field like the Earth does. We think it did a long time ago but it doesn't now, and we're using the InSight lander to currently try and get an idea of what's going on inside Mars. It's using seismometers and things like that to try and detect Mars quakes, because um, that can give us an idea of what's on the inside. When an earthquake happens on the Earth, the wave that travels out actually allows us to make a picture of the core of the Earth, because as the wave passes through different materials like iron or nickel, it changes speed and it uh, changes the way that it moves. So the material actually affects the earth, the wave the earthquake makes. So we can use uh, earthquakes on Earth to get an idea of what's inside the Earth. We can do the same thing and are doing the same thing on Mars. And we think that the inside of Mars's uh, core has cooled down or maybe stopped moving and so it stopped producing that magnetic field. And with its magnetic field gone, the, so, the solar winds, the particles that get sent out by the sun, stripped its atmosphere away into space. As the atmosphere got thinner, the boiling point of water went down. So most of this water evaporated off, we think. And then the oxygen was separated from the hydrogen by solar winds and bonded to iron in the rocks, which rusted the whole planet. So Mars is rusty, covered in rust. And we think that this will happen to the Earth in about 800 million years. So don't sell your house just yet, but be on your toes. Um, eventually, the core of the Earth will cool down to a point where it also, too, will probably lose its magnetic field. I see a question here that says, what causes Mars's blue sunsets? That is a great question. So Mars's atmosphere is different than the Earth's. It is mostly carbon dioxide. It's like 93% carbon dioxide and a little bit of nitrogen and argon with trace amounts of things like oxygen. And it's the nitrogen oxygen atmosphere of the Earth that makes our sky blue and makes our sunsets red and yellowish. And since the atmosphere on Mars is made out of different materials, at high noon, you don't really see much of the sky um, like as a color because the atmosphere is so thin, but it's actually kind of a greenish color because of that carbon dioxide. And then the sunsets have that blue color because of that carbon dioxide there as well. Mars is a cool place. I love Mars. Everybody loves Mars, especially Matt Damon. But there's other cool places out there in the universe and time is ticking on. So let's get some other suggestions as to what we want to yeah. see. Type in your suggestions for what you'd like to see next. I will tell you some of, there's been some great suggestions that I haven't mentioned because they're things we don't have good data sets for. Um, dwarf planets like Hanumea, um, we don't have a really good image for. All right, we're getting some great suggestions. Someone would like to see, Naomi, do you have an image for the Horsehead Nebula? I don't in here have a great one. Honestly, Hubble Space Telescope is fantastic. We, for things like nebulas, we do have some nebulas, they're just not that one. Um, but they're actually gifts from scientists that are doing research and creating data sets and visualizations and happen to share it with our planetarium community, which is pretty darn awesome. But no one for Horsehead yet. 
Can you yes. show us the Orion Nebula? I mean, not the Orion Nebula, the Orion Constellation. So then we can talk a little bit about the Orion Nebula. I see Orion popping up. Yeah. I also saw a pulsar pop up in the chat, and I'd love to go see one of those. <laughs> well, pretty quick. So we'll pop up Orion here real quick, and then we'll start traveling to a pulsar. And if we see Orion, I also saw a request for the Pleiades. So if you can see Orion in the sky, which is in a wintertime constellation, so you can't see it this time of year. Um, but you also, if you find Taurus, who's right in front of Orion, you can find the Pleiades just above his eyeballs, Taurus's eyeballs. And Pleiades are the seven sisters. That's actually a type of stellar cluster, which we call an uh, open cluster, not a globular cluster. Open clusters tend to be smaller than globular clusters, and they have uh, several thousands instead of, you know, millions and billions of stars, they have thousands of them. And actually, when we look at the Pleiades, we only see the seven brightest stars in that cluster. So if we could see, if our eyes were more sensitive, it would look incredibly dense with stars. Um, but there's Orion right there. And of course, very famous for those three stars uh, in Orion's belt. And scientists actually say that Orion's belt is a big waste of space. I don't. <laughs> and just below Orion's belt, you can see <laughs> Orion's sword. And that is the Orion Stellar Nursery. That's where uh, that's where baby stars come from. So we can uh, we have observed baby stars uh, being born. That sort of bright spot, right in between his legs, there is uh, uh, is actually several bright stars that have pushed away a big cloud of nebular gas, which allow us to see baby stars forming in there. And we should also mention that right in Orion's armpit uh, is that red supergiant Betelgeuse that is some point in the next one million years or so is definitely going to explode. And when it does, it'll be bright enough, you'll be able to see it during the daytime. Um, it won't it, blow us up though. But, it's, it's far enough away that its explosion will not affect us at all. That's the wonderful thing about space, is everything is so very far away. We think it won't affect us very much. Not I mean, when we see it blow up, maybe in like 600 million years after we see the explosion. So I'm not too worried. Yeah, if we see it, we got at least a thousand years before anything from it gets here. And that's if it's traveling at the speed of light. So we'll be, we'll, we'll, you'll be, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Okay. So this is B1919 plus, is it 31? 21. You were close. I'm impressed. Oh, that was, yeah. This is the first pulsar ever discovered. It's in the Little Fox constellation, or Volpe Cuba, which is another one of those really tough to find constellations. Um, this pulsar has a big, really strong magnetic field, which has material moving around it. And it, that magnetic field causes material to sort of be shot out of the north and south pole of the pulsar, because that's where the magnetic field is weak, just like on the Earth. And as that beam of material passes in front of our telescopes, our radio telescopes, it actually makes a little sound. Radio telescopes, you can plug in head, headphones and listen. They, you know, doing that in contact, right? She's got the headphones on and she hears the signal or whatever. Uh, and so with pulsars, they go boop, boop, boop in those radio telescopes. And that's why we call them pulsars. And they spin really fast. This pulsar rotates about once a second. Pulsars are the leftovers of exploded stars, supermassive stars. Uh, and I think this, uh, that magnetic field might be uh, slowing down our, our internet, so we might zoom out a little bit, Naomi. <laughs> uh, it's a little hard for the computer to render all those little, those little bits there. But uh, this used to be a massive star like Betelgeuse. It was able to fuse iron. It was really, really huge. And then uh, when the star reached the end of its life, stars are a balance between gravity trying to pull everything in to the center and the thermonuclear explosion that is pushing out. Now, as the star uh, burns through its fuel, gravity eventually starts to win that fight. So gravity pulled all of the mass of the star into the very center, and that caused a really huge explosion, thermonuclear explosion, that's the supernova. And then this pulsar here, or neutron star, is the leftovers. And neutron stars are extremely dense uh, material. They have a lot of gravity. Uh, and neutron stars, like this neutron star, I think is just about the size of the Denver metro area, not very big. And we, you know, using mathematics, we can extrapolate based on its gravitational attraction and things like that, how much 
uh, it weighs. And so a single teaspoon of this star would probably weigh about 200 million tons, which is crazy dense. And neutron stars are sort of like black holes that almost became, you know. Uh, if the star had been more massive, it had, if it had reached a, thir a certain threshold of mass, then instead of after the supernova, the core collapsing into a neutron star, it would collapse into a black hole instead. It was a, an Indian uh, scientist named uh, uh, Chandrasekhar who first calculated that black hole limit and theorized those back in the 1930s. We only have one picture of an observable black hole, which I'm sure made it onto everybody's Facebook feed or, or Google feed or whatever, um, back when it was taken. And that is uh, at a black hole at the center of a, a galaxy that's pretty far away. Black holes are hard to find because they don't shine and there's usually nothing close enough to them to, to be pulled in. And so since all of our observations use light and not even light can escape from black holes, it's really hard for us to find them. We usually detect them by seeing how they affect other objects. And it's usually not that we see a star get pulled in or pulled out of its orbit. What we usually see is a lensing effect. So the, gra the gravitational attract causes a lensing effect and we can see that it's bending the light around it. But that's about it. It's really hard for us to study black holes. There's that picture, that famous picture. They collected uh, five, is it? petabytes, five petabytes of data to make this one picture. Th that, like, what does that mean? Uh, if you wanted to store the information on iPhone 10s, you would need 78,000 of them. That's how much data they collected to take this one, to make this one um, image here. We're coming down, uh, we're almost out of time. I see a lot of references in the chat to uh, Venus. So let's fly off to Venus. We'll make that our final destination because I love Venus. Everybody loves Mars, I love Venus. Everybody's like, oh, we should colonize Mars. And I'm like, no, wrong, wrong. Go to Mars, it's a death trap. It's super cold, there's no protection from radiation on the surface. You can't grow poop potatoes. Mars, mistake, mistake. Mars so far away, you can only send a mission once every two and a half years. What if something goes wrong? Matt Damon was trying to warn us. We should go to Venus instead. It's much easier to get to. Uh, and I say we colonize Venus. Venus uh, counterpoint, Jose. Can yeah. I just point out that on Venus, the average temperature day and night is about 850 degrees Fahrenheit. It rains sulfuric acid. It snows metal. And the pressure is so intense on the surface of Venus, it would feel like standing at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that's if you're on the surface of Venus. And yes, that is true. The surface of Venus is a terrible hellscape where a submarine would get crushed and lit on fire at the same time. I will give that to you 100%. That snow and rain you're talking about never gets to the surface because it evaporates before it hits the ground. Uh, and there's probably lots of volcanoes down there and the atmosphere is spewing a lot of terrible stuff. But if we were to colonize Venus, we wouldn't live on the ground. We would live in the sky. We would live in some sort of deluxe apartment in the sky. And, uh, <laughs> Actually, there is a layer of uh, just above the uh, the lower atmosphere, which we call a hypercritical uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's not hypercritical because it like points out all your flaws. It's hypercritical because even though it's a gas, it acts like a liquid. And so you could actually float a colony on top of this hypercritical carbon dioxide. And the air that we breathe, nitrogen, oxygen, Earth atmosphere, would be less dense than that, uh, than that carbon dioxide. So we wouldn't need to have like fancy fans or anything. You could basically make a huge bunch of blimps up there. We could hang out with Lando Calrissian. That's another plus if we had a cloud city. Uh, and then, you know, you wouldn't even need a spacesuit to go outside because the pressure there at that level, which is about, um, it's about, I think, 70 kilometers above the surface or something like that, 40 kilometers above the surface. I'm not sure exactly how high up it is. But the pressure is similar to Earth's pressure. Venus has an ionosphere, so protection from radiation. It'd be easier to resupply Venus. You'd have to have um, some sulfuric acid resistant materials, but Teflon, we make plenty of that, and it is uh, definitely resistant to sulfuric acid. So we could easily uh, send a long-term mission to Venus. I think it would be much more feasible and much more realistic than Mars. 
But everybody loves Mars. Everybody loves Mars. <laughs> Not enough love for Venus. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We've come down to the end of our program. This has been so much fun. A uh, big virtual round of applause for our host, Jose, and our pilot, Naomi. Um, and since we started with a terrible space joke, I'd just like to leave you with a terrible space joke. What's the difference between a cow on Earth and a cow in space? Oh, no. One is a little meatier. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for sticking around with us during this difficult time. We hope to welcome you back into the actual museum uh, sometime very soon. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Keep looking up. Uh, enjoy hanging out on this rock, shooting through the emptiness of space. And go look up and find those constellations tonight. Oh yeah. Thank you everyone. <laughs>